youth ministry. Uh, we're both relatively young. Um, <laughs> and we both like object lessons. Um, and this is my object, if you didn't know, by the size of it. So I really, this is a nice chair. It's actually the, the chair that I have in my office, well, the conference room. They put me in a corner in the conference room. <laughs> I'm just messing with you guys. Um, but it's, it's actually relatively comfortable. And I think, yeah, it's, it leaned back some, you're, you know. I, it's a nice relaxing chair to sit in when I do work. Um, and I feel like, oh, if I can move this thing, I get closer to my notes because I already lost them. Um, so I think, I don't know about you, but we like comfortable things. Like we don't want to be uncomfortable with our lives. And so what I mean by that is like, say, after church, you guys, especially during winter, during football season, you have your sermon, you go to church, and then you come back home and you watch the Cowboys, probably most of you guys. <laughs> I didn't expect to hear amen after a Cowboys, but <laughs> I'm from Washington, in case you didn't know. Um, so you can boo me, I guess. Um, but we like the comfortable things. And like in America, we have very comfortable lives. We get paid pretty well. We get a, uh, we're apart from most of the, the dangers of the outside world. Um, we get to choose where we go to school, um, to not be bossed around by anyone except your boss. Um, but we have the luxury and the confidence to do as we please. America is a nice place to live, to build a family, to, to just have a nice job and stable job. And I did some research. I did some research about how good it is to live in America. And so I did some research about the GTB, or the nominal uh, GDP, which is basically, that's the inflated gross domestic product and the U.S. is on the top of the list. Go us. Go us. We're, we're making money. And the real median average for the household income in America is $56,516 in 2016. And that's done by the U.S. Census Bureau, in case you want to fact check me. Um, but while the median of the world is just less than $10,000, so statistically, all you guys should be making five times more than what the rest of the world, that's America and all the countries in Africa and Asia, all those combined, you're making five times more than the worldly average. You could say that you're living very comfortable lives. And it's nice to sit back, relax, watch the Cowboys, go on vacation, go to the Bahamas or something, have a nice home to live in. That's comforting, but I can tell most of you, I can just see it in your eyes. I can read it off your face. You're scared. Now that's weird to say, but you're scared because I know myself, I'm also as well scared. But you're scared that you might have to do something with your faith after Sunday. Once you leave these doors, it's a whole nother, whole nother world. You're scared like me, and I'll be the first to admit that. That I'm scared to share my faith with the people around me. And they say the most passionate sermons are the ones that speak to you. And I'm literally speaking to myself right now. So if, uh, if none of you guys get the sermon, then at least I will. Um, but I guarantee you guys probably will get this. See, 
we're called to be proclaimers of our faith. We're not supposed to be idle or passive in our faith. But instead, we, I've seen this so often, we are just frozen. We're just, we don't know what to do once we leave these walls. We're scared so comfortably in our faith. We're content with the way things are. We're comfortable with just going back to our home and not asking those deep questions. Mike and Marty, they do good sermons. They do good lessons. And they put their heart and soul into it. And we can't let that, these words be futile. We can't let them just be empty words. See, some of you might, might have things settled down. You might have retired. You might have just moved here, so that way you can raise a family. But see, we're called to, to live and not worry about those things. We're just not supposed, we're supposed to leave these things behind. Luke chapter 14 Jesus talks about hating the things that we would consider we should love, like our family. In Luke chapter 14, verse 25, it says, Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them. He said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And then in verse 33, it says, In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything, he has, he has, cannot be my disciple. That doesn't sound right. He has, cannot be my disciple. Oh, does not give up everything, he has not be my disciple. There we go. I figured it out. Um, see, I could be wrong, but I think Jesus is, is calling you out. I think he's calling me out. And lucky for all of us that maybe aren't comfortable in our house or, or whatever, Jesus calls us out in Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission. He says, go out into all the world and make disciples of every nation. So he's calling everyone out. That's supposed to be a follower of Jesus. It's supposed to be a follower of Christ. And I'll, I just want to point this out. You don't have to leave Oklahoma to, to be a disciple, to make disciples. And I, I researched this too. Um, but according to bestplaces.net, I don't know how reliable that source is. It's probably reliable. It has like economic values for states and uh, Money, housing, blah, blah, blah. I can go on. I, I can't, really. I'm just making things up. No. Um, but <laughs> according to bestplaces.net, 61% of the population in Oklahoma, that is, has some type of religious beliefs. That's a, that's a pretty decent number. That's more than half. That's pretty good. The, I think the United States is 50, 51, 49, something like that. And so that's over half. That's a good number. Um, but that just, that just leaves only 1.6 million people that don't have any belief at whatsoever. 1.6 million. Just in Oklahoma alone. That's, that's like a, if see, when you tell someone 61%, like say your company is 61% better than all the other companies you are competing with, you're like, they're probably like, oh yeah, that's, that's pretty good. You're almost top, top third. And then you say, yeah, there's like 1,600 other companies ahead of us. You're like, oh, that's pretty bad, actually. <laughs> You're not doing very good at all. Um, and I'm not trying to discourage you guys or make you not want to come to church at all. Um, sorry, Mike or Marty, if that does happen. But, see, I grew up in the church, and... I've grown up going to Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, the traditional church schedule, as you can say. And I'm kind of, I'm kind of tired of this tradition that 
We just, um, after hearing a nice, like, impassionate sermon that Mike or Marty or whatever preacher says is like, do this, or be the Word, be Jesus. And then right after the prayer and after service, the next thing we say to our neighbor or our family is like, can we go to Chili's now? <laughs> or can we go to Cheddar's? And there's nothing wrong with those things. I just went to Cheddar's this, this uh, lunch with uh, Dayton and Ruth, and it was, it was great. But, but when we're so focused on, on where we're going to eat, there's 1.6 million people that don't have any faith, and we're worried about food. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of frustrating. It's kind of disheartening. The preacher, just, the preacher just gave you his heart and soul, and you just have the audacity to tell, or tell him, like, can we go to Chili's now? Let's, let's just go to Chili's now. But, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's really nothing wrong with that. I'm kidding about the whole Chili's thing, but, but really I'm not. There's actual seriousness, and I think you guys would agree with me on that. I don't think I'm just speaking random words. I think this comes back to our fear. We're so scared. We're so caught up in this nice, comfy chair that we, we have everything in control of, and we don't have to get up. We can just sit back and just just see the world as it is instead of going out into the world as Jesus calls us to do. And it comes back to, in verse 33, am I giving up everything for Jesus? Am I giving up everything? Am I sacrificing enough? And I know for my own life, no, I'm not. It's a chair. That's a nice chair. I go to work in that most days whenever I'm in the office. And I sit in it every day, and I'm like, this is nice. And I obviously have to do my work because I'm supposed to and blah, blah, blah. But, but metaphorically speaking, we all have this comfy chair. might not be as good as my chair, though. Um, we, we're so scared about changing our consistent lifestyle. <coughs> that consistent thing that just is our tradition. We're, it would be weird. It would be so unheard of to do anything different because we've built it ourselves. See, there's, this, um, there's a professor at Oklahoma, Christian, and, and he's been there for like 20 years, and he said the same thing for every single class, I'm pretty sure, and, and Mike could tell you the truth. He, he does say this every single class, but he says, people are dying and going to hell. Now, most of you guys probably didn't expect me to come up here and talk about hell at all, but I'm not going to talk about hell, so you're lucky. Um, I've saved that for Marty and Mike. Um, but I'm really picking on you guys. I'm sorry. I didn't. It's fine. <laughs> you get every other Sunday. Um, so it's obvious, but we have to somehow get out of this comfort zone. We have to somehow change our lifestyles. We have to do something differently within our lives because that chair is still going to be there. Satan's still going to be telling us, oh, we don't need to change. No, 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 no. There's other people that get paid to do missionary stuff. They get paid to preach on Sundays and, and whatnot. So don't even worry about it. You can just sit down and do your normal job that you actually get paid for. Jesus never promised any of us to get paid. Even Paul didn't want to get paid for what he did for the Lord. We're not called to sit idly as the world spins around us, but to serve, to do something with our lives. Mark chapter 10, verse 45, says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to the earth and he gave us everything. He gave, he was humiliated, he was beaten, 
and he ultimately died on a cross for us. He gave us his life. The Son of God, who had no need to, he didn't need to do this, but, but thanks be to God that he did, because he has served us so, so much. And he gave it all. He gave his all to us. He gave everything physically for us. And the Son of God, he gave his life physically. He gave everything physically. He gave everything spiritually. He gave us the hope of resurrection after our death, to be in heaven. And after he died, he didn't just say, oh, good luck with that. No, he gave us his Holy Spirit. He gave a part of God himself, that trinity, in us. And see, the spirit is not idle. It's not passive. It hungers to do something. It cries out, as Paul says in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 through 17. If I can turn there, that'd be nice. I need to learn my books of the Bible, apparently. Um, that's what I'm in school for. Romans chapter 8. Paul says this, starting in verse 9. You, however, are controlled not by sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. Yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness, that is grace. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature, to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if, you, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear that being comfortable with where you're at. But instead, Paul goes on and says, for you received a spirit that makes you, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the Holy Spirit of sonship. We were adopted into God, being able to be in his presence. There was that barrier with sin, that dividing wall, that curtain that separated the most holies and holies in us. And Jesus tore it down by dying and raising again. And continuing on in 16, or in 15 actually. But you receive the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I'm going to repeat that last part because it's, it's important. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. If we follow Christ, if we actually be a disciple, if we actually sacrifice physically everything. I mean everything. Jesus, Jesus just said in Luke chapter 14 that we need to sacrifice everything to him. Sacrifice everything to follow him. If we sacrifice and suffer for him, we have eternal glory. We can be in forever in heaven.
this chair is really nice. It's really comfortable. But I need to stop sitting in that chair. Not that chair, that's a nice chair. But my metaphorical chair that I am so comfortably sitting in my life that I am too scared, too comfortably scared to move. The spirit wants to be near God, and yet we do not come near him. James 4, 8, if we come near to God, God will come near to us. We cannot be afraid to follow God. Because why? Because God has never failed. If you tell me a time God failed, then, then the sermon's awfully useless. Um, but if God can, has not failed, let's get up and be servants. Let's follow God and give everything to him because there is an end purpose. There is an end goal. See, the world, this chair, keeps telling us, hey, it's nice right now. It's nice right now. Don't need to do anything. But that doesn't lead anywhere because we're just idle. We're just passive. We can't get anywhere. The spirit longs for action, to be doing something. And if none of that encourages you to actually do anything, which I hope it actually does, but in case it doesn't, I'm going to go to probably one of my favorite verses in the Bible, which is Judges chapter 6. Again, you have to just uh, be patient with me because I can't turn to the right section. Um, Judges chapter 6, in verse 14, this is, the Lord is talking to Midian, or not Midian, to Gideon. And if you know Gideon, you know that he was the guy that was like, all right, God, this is really cool that you're with me, but how about you make this, this grass wet and then you make the blanket not wet? That would be, that'd be a really cool trick that you did. Then I might be like, oh, oh, you did it? Oh, gosh. Um, okay, well, how about this, God? How about you, how about you make the blanket wet and then the grass not wet? Ah, uh-huh, you can't do that probably. Oh, gosh, you did. Well, then I guess I have to follow you now. No. So this, so this is the, that's the guy. That's the guy that God's talking to, the Lord is talking to. And the Lord says to him, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Am I not sending you? Is Jesus not calling you to be his disciple? Is Jesus not calling you to be baptized, to sacrifice everything to follow him? Is God not enough for you to follow him? So, if you haven't been baptized, but you feel if you're being called to follow and to forgive and get the forgiveness of your sins, or if you need the encouragement of your brothers and sisters to help you get up out of your your chair that you are so comfortable in that sin or whatever it may be that you need the encouragement from everyone else, come as we stand and sing.